Okay, I'm going to go over the essay question here on epistemic injustice. So what I've done here, looking at the, the prompt, basically just kind of framed a kind of standard explain and analyze kind of paper or type of inquiry for this paper. And um, yeah, I'm going to go in, you know, go in a little bit on what would be expected to be done there. In terms of you, where you come in, you know, most of that is really described at the very end. You know, explain what you take to be the best formulation of epistemic injustice in light of the objections just considered. You know, that's something that you can and should be doing all along the way. You don't really have to leave that all to the end. But as you're going through the earlier part, so explaining the differences between testimonial injustice and hermeneutical injustice, looking at these objections by Maitra, you're adding your, <clears throat> excuse me, adding your judgment there all along the way, you know, um, and then by the time you get to this, you can kind of largely be summing up the kind of bringing together, let's bring this all together, the views, the objections, and the, you know, many comments on these views and the objections that you've been adding along the way. So you're kind of more bringing an analysis that you've been giving together at the end here, rather than just kind of doing it at the end. Okay, so having said that, um, <clears throat> and of course, you know, you can and should intimate like what you're going to be saying at the end, at the beginning, and, you know, wrap a nice, cohesive, thematically unified paper around this prompt. I'm not really giving you that in the prompt itself, right? So this is kind of the nuts and bolts, and kind of you'll make a paper out of it. <clears throat> and, you know, at broad level, that's the main thing that I'll be looking for you, looking, looking at for grading your paper, is I you know, definitely want to make sure that there's, like, um, a, a good substantive understanding and knowledge of um, Fricker's two different conceptions of in, uh, epistemic injustice here, and that you can show some kind of understanding of some of Mitra's criticisms of Fricker, and in light of criticisms, you're ultimately evaluating her view and providing whatever intuitions or additions to the general idea of epistemic injustice that you think should be there. So in one way or another, that's pretty much what <clears throat> I'd be looking for this paper to do. So I'm kind of sketching out here one way to do that. So I'll kind of start with that and just kind of go through that a little bit. So here I'm explaining to, to ask you to explain the difference between testimonial and hermeneutical injustice. Here, of course, you want to be using some um, direct quotes from the reading, reading itself. And um, that's always something that you should be doing if you're explicating somebody's view, lay down some direct quotes so we can, the reader can be sure that you are adequately representing them. So make sure you're plopping down some quotes there. So the testimonial injustice is, uh, you know, just to say quickly, just really as a reminder, um, <clears throat> that's the kind that an individual hearer does to an individual speaker. And they do that by like reducing their credibility rating just on the basis of their membership of a social kind, where having that social kind membership is taken as all by itself as grounds for reducing your credibility as a knower. So that's pretty much her, her definition there. Um, the hermeneutical injustice is different because uh, well, the whole thing is different. The perpetrator, so to speak, is much more subtle because it's a social structure. It's like the it's like the communicative resources of a society taken together, like what we're able to articulate given the communicative resources available in a society. 
So if that's inadequate, that's kind of like the fault is due to the social structure. And maybe there's particular individuals who created that problem, but that's a fundamentally different kind of problem than an individual lowering your credibility rating. I could see how the hermeneutical injustice would lead to the testimonial injustice. That's something you might bring up, and it's actually kind of a perfect example of how you might add a little something to pure explanation and thus rise to the level of explication if in the process of explaining testimonial injustice and hermeneutical injustice you point out certain important interesting connections. And these might very well be things that you'll go on to pick up on later in the paper. So that's just an example of how you can kind of do more or less even though you're just explaining. I'm just stopping on that because that's an example of like noting, you know, when you look at this, like, wow, you know, somebody that's subject to hermeneutical injustice, I could totally see how down the road they might become subject to testimonial injustice because you won't generally sound like somebody that knows what they're talking about if you're subject to hermeneutical injustice. In which case, you might soon find yourself subject to testimonial injustice. So, um, yeah, really, that opens up lots of interesting areas uh, for thinking, I, I think. So, yeah, yeah. So uh, do this. Uh, when you're characterizing these, make sure that you do two things. Characterize what's distinctively epistemic about both. That should have you looking closely at the kind of harm produced and I would say like the instrument of producing harm, which are going to be like, in the case of testimonial injustice, a way of hearing another person is actually the instrument of harm rather than like a gun or a knife or something, right? So that's different. And the kind of harm is not like blood or guts or like broken bones, but rather a lowered credibility ratio. So these are different from your from the causes of harm and the kind of harm itself from like ordinary crimes. You know, if you think about like you know battery or theft or things like that, the kind of harm done in the epistemic case is pretty different, and it should be. So you want to emphasize how it's different. <clears throat> the instrument of harm also is a bit different. It's all pertaining to words and you know things epistemic, and uh, you should emphasize that too. So within emphasizing the difference generally between these two kinds of epistemic injustice, which have these things in common between themselves, and regular injustice, you also then want to say how it is that the testimonial and the herm hermeneutic differ from one another, even though they're both one of these forms. You know, like they, what they do have in common is that they're both forms of epistemic injustice, which, you know, taken together, is different from these other kinds. But even within epistemic injustice, we can see these variations emerge. That's generally a good way to introduce a concept rather than just kind of giving a boring like definition from the book kind of thing and wondering like well what else is there to say um, you can see here the little narrative that i just gave brings in some kind of superstructure you might say kind of brings some structure and some analysis to the kind of pedestrian job of introducing and defining these concepts right so can always do that. Uh, actually, you know, laying out definitions of terms is kind of an art in philosophy, even when you're just laying out and defining terms that are already well defined, so to speak. Um, kind of reconstructing that in a philosophically useful way to set up a debate is really a super important philosophical skill. And one of the things that I think authors in philosophy spend most of their time doing. Because a lot of it 
turns out to be like, well, how are you approaching the thing from the beginning? And how we represent that, like the context within which we see just a bare definition, is always important philosophically, but also for the purpose of paper writing. You know, you want to kind of lay hints of what you're going to be going on to say now, so that when you get there, the reader's like, oh yeah, oh, okay, so I can see why why we're here now, or I kind of had a sense this was coming, or you know, it makes a more cohesive and just better paper. Okay, so uh, Maitra's got objections. I think they're pretty good in general, but here I think what I'm looking for is to see that you can kind of really separate out, and here again, of course, you should be quoting Maitra, uh, that you can really separate out like strands of her many objections, because there's a lot of different ones, and that you can really clearly line that up to, let's call it a Fricker target, <laughs> or like some target in Fricker's view that this very specific objection from Maitra hits, or even what it's aiming for. I should say more so than it hits, what it's aiming for, so that you can really line up objections and targets when you're discussing Maitra, and you can really articulate the objection in such a way that we can see why that really aims at and at least threatens to hit that target. So again, that's kind of like a, there's work there for you to be doing, even though you're just kind of articulating somebody's view, there's still a lot of work to be done in kind of you being able to really set that up in a way that lines up the content of the objection and the content of the target. And yeah, and you can kind of add various things to that. You know, you can observe, make certain observations, you can add certain points that might just kind of help uh, Maitra kind of like fill out her claim. Maybe there's misunderstandings in Maitra's objection that you can already see is present there, and you can kind of put a little marker like, you know, this is something to be looked at over here, and we're going to come, that up, come back to that in a moment after we get out of view, because it's not obvious that this is really fair or proper to Fricker or something like that. These are just examples of how you can kind of put a little marker that you're going to come back to in your analysis while you're still essentially explaining somebody's view. It doesn't mean you can't do anything. And indeed, you should be doing something, um, even if it's just adding. So you know, I've, been, I've talked about this idea of an explication, which is like a value-added explanation, where you add some value to what you're explaining without changing what it is that's being explained. You don't want to do that. And now you're not really explaining it anymore if you've kind of changed the views. But you don't have to <clears throat> change it just to add value. Okay, so now I'm asking you here, well, I can think of some better ways I might have put this, but um, you know, now explain what you take to be the best formulation of epistemic injustice in light of the objections just considered. So, I mean, basically what I'm asking you here, um, you know, looking at the view, you've looked at some questions about the view of what epistemic injustice is from Maitra. You should and probably do have some of your own questions, concerns, etc. But really important here is what you have to do. How, and maybe this is the best way to think of what this part of the paper is, how is... How would Fricker, or could Fricker, respond to this host of concerns about her view? How could she respond? Um, are there kind of like quick, obvious little fixes that she might make that wouldn't be that big of a deal? And you just kind of like tighten it up a little bit? Some of Maitra's objections seem to be just that, things where you could kind of add an additional clause in the, addition, in the original definition and... Um, seemingly avoid the worry. Or maybe there's more like fundamental, like, wow, this is kind of like a little deeper kind of problem. Um, or whatever it turns out to be, um, what's your kind of overall assessment of the adequacy of her view taking into consideration what she might say to repair it against the objections that you've adduced in cahoots with Maitra, of course. So that's you know pretty standard philosophical fare, and it's actually a really good skill to be able to have 
to explain how a view can be modified to accommodate shortcomings that have been brought up. And to be able to do that in such a way that the modifications really address the shortcomings. And now we've got the kind of new improved version. And here we go. That's kind of like standard philosophical practice instead of like, you know, throwing out the baby with the bathwater or whatever, you can make the right kinds of adjustments. And you can kind of explain how the adjustments are responsive to the objections. It's actually the kind of thing a lot of people do in a lot of, a lot of areas in life. <laughs> but uh, that's one thing that uh, philosophers do. All right, so I think that'll probably do it there. And at the end, there's plenty of room for you to kind of articulate your own ideas and visions and thoughts about epistemic injustice for the world that we live in, which seems to be full of that. <laughs> so uh, ample opportunities to, at the very end, to kind of apply this to the world. I'm really not looking for this paper to be all about that, though. I'm not really looking for you to make this a paper even about very important contemporary affairs that I think probably exhibit a lot of this stuff. My thought is that, sure, that's good to kind of get here in the end for this paper as it is, but I see my contribution or the value of this as really giving you a deeper understanding of the issues themselves and to like be in a position after the class is over or outside of the paper to really apply this, bring it into action, bring it into the world, make it important, all that, and stuff that you do on the strength of this paper that really gets you deeper into knowing the basis on which you make all of those statements. And you can go make those statements for the rest of your life, but you want to have a good basis for them in knowledge of these people and others um, upon which to, to make, make your claims. So that's kind of how I see the value of kind of college in general, but it's kind of giving you a knowledge basis for doing something outside of college, right? After college or in, even if it's now, it's outside of the classroom. So it's not that it's unimportant how all of this stuff would bear on, quote, what's going on now or what's been going on for a while in Western societies, um, but that it's kind of preparing you to, to really do that outside of the paper itself. So I want these to be pretty scholarly, limited, kind of boring-ish, think-in-the-box kind of essays, to be honest, and you can take it outside of the box for the rest of your life. All right. So that's that.